My desire to contribute to the needs of the transgender community originated at the Harry Benjamin Conference, H. Bigda, in London in 1998. And it was there I attended several talks about what was being called gender dysphoria. One such presentation was given by recognized researchers who were also gender reassignment surgeons and their staff. And although their research was incomplete, they were of the opinion that they may have discovered a biological basis for gender dysphoria from <coughs> autopsies of brains that they had studied. They had very few examples, as I can recall, something like five or six. And basically, they had to wait for more gender dysphoric people to die to perform autopsies before they could complete their research. I personally found their suppositions to be questionable and weak. I don't know if they ever completed their research, but the conference gave me a measure of hope at the time. I hope that I was not some unexplainable freak of nature, but rather an explainable one. <laughs> if there was a biological basis for gender dysphoria, I thought I would be comforted somehow. So on a plane trip home to Chicago, I thought about how an organization that collected tra transgender-specific materials might possibly be helpful to aid researchers in their work. I also thought it might be possible for such an organization to perform research of its own. And that is how RSI was born. I purchased a building in downtown Chicago. It was in the corridor of Chicago. It wasn't in the actual downtown loop area, if you know Chicago. And acquired materials from avid collectors such as Virginia Prince, Barry Kane, IFGE, and others. And we employed persons to perform cataloging work. Laura, I'm sure you'll admit we didn't do a very good job, but, <laughs> but we were in the process. And we also employed a person to set up the biological research program. And things were going very well with the archival collections. RSI was being visited by credentialed researchers, and meetings regarding the research plans were taking place. However, it was becoming apparent to me that the research path was struggling to find itself. I won't say that I fully realized the problem at the onset, but I knew something was amiss. It didn't feel right that our goal was to prove something that we all wanted to believe, and quite honestly, we were already convinced of. And due to our hypothesis, we were willing to overlook other possibilities. In retrospect, I could see that we had a huge bias, and that was what was making me uncomfortable. <coughs> We already had the conclusion that by starting someplace in the middle, we were going to prove a biological basis for transgenderism. Well, the research never developed beyond that point. It languished mostly because I was uncomfortable with the plan and the process. I did a lot of my own personal study at that time, and I didn't have the background to fully explain my own concerns. But since then, I have concluded my studies, and I will share my conclusions with you in a moment. Before I do, I want to mention that it was at that point that RSI started to shut down. And I moved to Victoria, where we are today, BC. And I began to scout out new locations for RSI. And during that process, I guess I could say process now. I moved back to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> process. Sometime in 2005, Aaron DeVore asked me if I would consider donating the collection of materials to UVic for inclusion in what would become a yet larger library with other collections being added in years to come. And I made the decision to accept his proposal based on primarily two considerations. The first being that I thought UVic would afford permanence and greater asset access to the collections which exceeded my capability. And I was becoming, this is the second reason, I was becoming increasingly, increasingly unsure about the biological origins of gender dysphoria. Things were just not adding up in my mind. 
So after donating the collections to UVic, I continued my studies exploring the basis for gender dysphoria or transsexualism or what popular culture has come to call transgenderism. And I would like to share my observations and conclusion with you now. <coughs> the answer to the question if transgenderism is biological is a profound yes. But the biological aspect is not one that we are born with. I do not believe that there is anything we are born with that causes a person to desire or believe they are mistakenly male or female. It simply isn't possible because maleness and femaleness are cultural creations. How we dress, walk, talk, look, act, etc. are all taught. In fact, they are imprinted. In our culture, this imprinting can start from before we are born. Ultrasound imaging tells us the baby's sex and rooms get painted, bedding is purchased, blankets and toys are acquired, all with pink or blue gender stereotyping at the helm. Boys get trucks and guns and girls get dolls, and we treat them differently and we reinforce what we believe to be gender, genuine gender characteristic difference and we don't think twice. <coughs> boys go to war and girls stay home, boys drive trucks, girls stay with the kids. Everything we are taught from before birth is gender stereotypical and everything we are encouraged to do in life is that way too. What if we didn't have these influences? What if we never saw another person? How would it be possible to be something <coughs> or want to be something we have never experienced? The stereotyping is so strong that some object openly, some more than others. Cross-dressers display their objection through an alternate gender presentation on a part-time basis. Transsexuals ranging from pre-op to post-op demonstrate their objection on a full-time basis. These alternative manifestations can be the result of believing that one's true self is more like the alternate presentation in some or all ways. It can be a way of letting the world know that one is not necessarily the gender stereotype the culture has defined, or it can be a resentment of that stereotype, or a combination of both. Manifestations of alternate gender presentation can be for reasons of monetary or personal gain, such as acknowledgement or notoriety. And there may be other root causes, but the reality of each of them is that they are based on cultural inventions of our society. They are not biological in origin. Their origins always come from external influences. Without the influence, it would not be possible to long to be something that was unknown. Without examples of other lifestyles or gender presentations, it would be impossible to wish to be one of them. So how is transgenderism profoundly biological? <coughs> Current research teaches us that the brain operates with billions of neurons, which are cells, of which each are connected to tens of thousands of other neurons, and they fire electrical and chemical pulses and discharges between themselves via connection wiring called axons and points known as synapses. These firings happen simultaneously in the trillions per second, awake and sleeping. We don't know their language, so we can't read them yet. But we do know that they form the basis of our senses, our thoughts, and our memories. There are neurons in the areas of the brain that are pre-formatted for certain things, sight, hearing, sensory perception, for example. For example, we all have a speech center, which is in our left brain, and if it's damaged, for example, from a stroke, we can no longer speak. This is common to us all. But then there are neurons that we mentally program via our experiences. <coughs> Consider that there are billions of neurons, and each one can be connected to 10,000 other neurons. The number of possible combinations is in the trillions. And those individual combinations of neurons further combine to form neuronal networks that fire their component neurons either simultaneously or sequentially, and they turn on and off several times per second. And this forms the basis of our thoughts, memories, emotions, awareness, you name it. This mental programming takes place in our brain as a result of our experiences. When we experience something new, our brains establish a network of connections. Cultural influences 
including our individual understanding of what is maleness and femaleness, are part of these experiences and become memories which are recallable cultural experiences that we can shape in combination with others. It's pretty much possible to believe anything we want. And there are some pretty outrageous beliefs out there today, like creationism. <laughs> I found out the other day that there was a Gallup poll in 19, 2012 that says that 46% of Americans believe in creationism. I was overwhelmed by that. And it sure helps if we're guided by group activity like a church or an organization. How many times in your life have you looked around at what others were doing to determine what you should be doing? When, transgender, when a transgender person experiences other persons who think they are transgender too, they reinforce each other's beliefs and the culture of transgenderism grows. Transgender persons who network externally through the internet and conferences and symposiums are forming <laughs> internal networks in their brain and therein lies the biological component. But they are not born with it. It was acquired and developed through experiences. The culture of our Western state society <coughs> is not the only place we find transgender persons. The Fafafini of Samoa are often lumped into the transgender category, and they are another example of transgender origin that stems from cultural influences. In early times, they were mostly a product of parental determination. In other words, we've got too many boys in our family, we need a girl to perform traditional girl tasks, so the overflow boy is raised as a Fafafini. The evolution of the Fafafini has developed into something that is more of a third sex in today's Samoan culture. Boys feel more comfortable in traditional female roles and dress are accepted in Samoan society. But here again, their gender presentation is decidedly the result of cultural influences. I have found no significant evidence, certainly no offsetting counterpart to the Fafafini with Samoan girls who believe themselves to be boys. If transgenderism were of biological origin, then why would girls escape this condition? This also holds true of Hydra in India. There is no female to male counterpart that I can find here either. The only female to male example I can cite outside of society similar to our own is that of Afghanistan girls who are presented as boys, typically by their family because male sons are viewed as valuable resources and girls are severely restricted in their movements in public and they fear being raped, which sometimes, somehow seems to be culturally condoned if girls engage in freedoms traditionally reserved for only males. And of interest, further interest, is that examples of male to female transgenderism in Afghanistan is either non-existent or a very, very small number, uh, with the exception of American military personnel. So I have concluded that the origins of transgenderism in any individual are not the result of biological origins, but transgenderism becomes biological through a unique programming of their brain. I believe our society and many professionals have gone to great lengths to suggest otherwise. And unfortunately, there are some enterprising persons and industries that have come into prosperity and popularity along the way. Think of the psychologists, the psychiatrists, the surgeons, and other professionals that make a living from this. Speaking for myself, I don't have any regrets about being transgender, but it's not what I hoped, and it's not what I thought. It's not what I was taught. And it's not as bad as being some unexplainable freak of nature, which was an early concern. <laughs> I look at it as more of an honest representation of who I am, given the rule book established and endorsed by our gender stereotypical society. And this truthfulness makes me feel better about myself. But it's not something I was born with. What I was born with is the capacity to become transgendered, and I believe we all have that. So where does that bring us today 
And more importantly, how does all this impact the future of the transgender and these archives? Well, we are already seeing future directions unfold in our younger people of today. They are not labeling themselves as gay, straight, or transgender, but gender queer. I like it. It's a beginning to break down the gender stereotyping that got us here in the first place. And it begins to break down the sexual preference stereotyping as well. That's another area of my interest and possibly the origin of the culture that makes gender stereotyping possible, but that's another story for another time. As for the archives, all I can say is that it's important to preserve the truth about the path we took to accomplish what we have. The truth will free us all. <laughs>